Egypt. Why is Egypt so special? All over the world, many people come and visit this place. Is it something about its land or its people? Is it the past, the present, or may it be the future? Egypt is a land of adventure, not only for its past, but also for its present. When people visit Egypt, they might not only visit Pharaonic Egypt, the pyramids, the temples, and tombs. There is another part of Egypt which is hidden, and this is Christian Egypt. It is a land so blessed because of many of our great fathers have visited Egypt, like fathers Abraham, Jacob and Joseph. But more than this, Christ himself came here early in his childhood with his mother, the Virgin Saint Mary, and Saint Joseph the carpenter, fleeing from Herod's killings. Today, Egypt is alive and surviving due to the prayers and blessings of a group of special people. Although these people live far away from the towns and villages of Egypt, they make a major contribution to the life of the church. We would like you to come with us now to the journey of the Desert Fathers. Egypt has long been considered by the whole world the cradle of monasticism. Monasticism dates back to the third century AD at the time of the Roman Empire. The father of monasticism is Saint Anthony the Great. Saint Anthony was an Egyptian born in 251 AD, the son of pious, wealthy Christian parents. At the age of 18, he heard the gospel reading in church saying, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Immediately, Saint Anthony applied these words to himself sold all his possessions, sent his younger sister to a house for virgins and went to the inner wilderness, the wilderness of the Red Sea. He lived for 105 years. There are three types of monastic orders. The first type is monarchism, where monks live in complete solitude and are known as hermits or anchorites. The second type is the Cenobitic order adopted by Saint Anthony in the third century. His monasticism comprised both solitude and companionship, for each of his followers lived in a cell in utter loneliness throughout the week. They assembled around him on Saturday evening for prayer and remained together till Sunday noon, where they took together a meal called a rabbi after participating in the Eucharist liturgy, celebrated by monk priests. After that, they would disperse to resume their solitude until the following Saturday. The life of monks in these deserts was not subject to any written rule. It was regulated above all by the traditions of the elders transmitted orally. The third type, which was founded by Saint Bucumius, the communal monastic life. He organized the life of the monks submitting them to fixed rules and regulations by which they were to live together in one common life. The monks had everything in common, prayer, meals and work. The teachings of the upper Egyptian monk, Bacomius, was the spark that ignited the spirit of monasticism in the whole of Western countries. There were nine monasteries that were under the direction of Saint Bacomius at the time when he passed away in the fourth century. At that time, there were 5,000 monks in the Canonia, the community. Saint Bacomius is entitled the father of Canonian monasticism. This type of monasticism prevails today. It is said that in the fourth century, there were thousands of monasteries starting from Alexandria in Lower Egypt to Aswan in Upper Egypt. And when the monastery bells rang for morning prayers, they could be heard from monastery to monastery in the line running from Lower to Upper Egypt. It is also said that at the time of the Arab conquest in 641 AD, there were 70,000 insetis, 
Today, a total of about 1,000 monks inhabit the 15 monasteries of Egypt. The most significant change to the monastic life was affected by the construction of desert roads leading to the monasteries, thus lifting the desert fathers out of their geographical isolation. The original places of withdrawal from the world, protected by miles of impossible desert sand, have now become popular pilgrimage sites that can be reached in a few hours by car or bus. On certain seasons, literally hundreds of visitors descend upon the desert monasteries and youth groups gather there for spiritual retreats and conferences. Here in the desert, close to the Red Sea, a four-hour drive from Cairo, there is the monastery founded by the most renowned of the anchorites, Saint Anthony, the father of all monks. The monastery is like a small village in which 90 monks live. The magnificent landscaping of the monastery can be seen with both the 3rd century buildings surrounded by the 10th and 19th century new buildings. The monastery has seven churches, old and new monk cells, guest houses both in and outside the wall, the keep, a garden, a cemetery, a bakery, generator room, a library, a museum, a gift shop and a kiosk. Fifty years ago, the main monastery gates were closed and the only way to enter the monastery was through a pulley. It functioned in two ways, to lift up the visitors and through Christian love, fed the Bedouins in the surrounding desert. Today the gates are opened for all Christians. Each of the monasteries that we are about to show you have a unique feature to them. St Anthony's Monastery is the first monastery in the world. Upon entering the monastery, the visitor will be taken for a tour. If there is enough time and he can spare the three hours, the visitor will be taken 400 metres to the top of the mountain where the popular St Anthony's Cave still exists. A magnificent view over the Wadi Arabia can be seen from this point. The agony of the hour's climb becomes a relief upon entering the cave. Here St Anthony lived for 20 years. Once a year on the 30th of January a service is held in the cave to commemorate his departure. The cave has four parts. The cave, four metres by two metres in length, the tunnel, 98 centimetres wide and 5 metres in length. A terrace and balcony. It is here that the saint used to make his palm leaf baskets. St. Anthony used to practice his prayers and spiritual meditation in this cave. An angel of God would appear to St. Anthony showing him how to go about spending his time wisely. The angel showed St. Anthony how to make baskets and to plait ropes. He even told him how to wear a tunic and a kolonsoa or hood on his head. Most times were difficult as the devil would appear to St. Anthony in many different forms to tempt him so he could fall into his hand. Each time St. Anthony would call for God's help and upon doing the sign of the cross, Satan would dissolve. Father Daniel L. Anthony, originally from Sydney, is a monk priest from the monastery of St. Anthony. Today he has been successfully serving in Australia for over 12 years since his consecration as a monk. 
we will talk about uh, uh, monastic life and uh, who is a monk and uh, what is the uh, life of a monk in a monastery and how they how they spend their day in the monastery. Around an hour's drive from St. Anthony's Monastery is the Monastery of St. Paul, or Paul of the Hermit. Very similar in size and structure to St. Anthony's Monastery, although a smaller number of monks live here, 55 monks and 22 novices in total. Before St. Anthony, there were many hermits scattered in the desert that no one knew about until St. Paul was found by St. Anthony. At one stage, St. Anthony thought of himself as the only living anchorite in the wilderness. Only then did God reveal to St. Anthony of another, by the name of Abba Paula, the hermit, who had lived for 80 years in the desert without seeing anyone. As soon as these two fathers met together, a crow carrying a loaf of bread descended from the heavens and left it in front of them. Abba Paula said to St. Anthony, You are from God, my father. As the many years I have lived in the wilderness, I would receive only half a piece of bread. But today God has sent us one whole piece. The monastery of St. Paul was built on the cave site of St. Paul before the year 400 AD. The monastery was attacked several times over its history by Bedouins of Upper Egypt. When the monastery was destroyed in 1484 AD, the Bedouins burnt St. Paul's church and the library and killed all the monks. The Bedouins occupied the monastery for about 80 years. The monastic buildings are concentrated around the cave where the hermit is believed to have lived in seclusion for 80 years. The Church of St. Paul was built over this cave where his remains are buried. The wall paintings are among the earliest in Egypt believed to date to the 4th century. All the figures are frontal and the execution of the work is simple and typically Coptic in spirit. This is the three young men and uh, you can read about them in Daniel. With the fourth one, he looks like the son of the god. And this is the three archangel. And here is Saint Mary carrying Jesus Christ between the seraphim and the cherubim. This is Saint Moses, the black. Here. The other three churches in the monastery are dedicated to Saint Macarius, the Holy Virgin and Archangel Michael. The later is the largest and dates to the 17th century. Both monasteries water supplies comes miraculously deep from within the surrounding mountains. The bitter and salty water emerges from a crevice in the rock and flows into a cement basin. This in turn flows into another basin situated a few meters away. The first is used for drinking and cooking, the second for washing and a third basin channels the water for irrigating the gardens. 
the flow of water varies miraculously, depending upon the number of monks inhabiting the monastery at that time and the number of visitors. The monasteries today are not only for the monks, but also for the people who wish to visit or have a retreat. As Christ instructed his apostles in Matthew, As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So too the Holy Fathers pray for the many people who come to the monasteries. Father Fanus in Mbabola is one of the holy and simple monks in the monastery. West of Cairo is situated the four monasteries of Wadi Nutrun. As Saint Anthony founded the Monastery of the Red Sea, so too Saint Macarius the Great ventured here and discovered the quietness that he had failed to find elsewhere. This was the area that eventually became the centre of Coptic monasticism, the region into which the great saints of the Egyptian Church lived Saint Macarius the Great, Saint Beshoi, Saint John the Dwarf. Saint John Cami, and above all this, the Holy Family blessed this area during their flight from King Herod. The eight salty lakes lie in a 35 kilometer line from one end of the Wadi to the other. It has been known by a number of other names also, Setus, Shahid, and Wadi El Natrun. A 90 minute drive from Cairo on the desert road will bring you to the monastery of St. Macarius. Some of the buildings in this monastery were built by St. Macarius in 360 AD at the age of 60. He dearly loved solitude and quietness. Nevertheless, his followers increased and formed surrounding communities by building dwelling houses, manchafis, of mud bricks, roofed with reed, designed to meet the dual objective of voluntary poverty and absolute tranquility. They began as individuals, but soon their number ran into thousands. Just 20 years ago, the monastery was desolate, very small and inhabited by five old monks. Today, just over 100 monks reside in this monastery. This is a Bahamian monasticism at its finest. Pious men with vision and education combined the life of contemplation with prayer and discipline. The 20th century buildings surrounding the old monuments have been constructed under the guidance of the abbot of the monastery. There are three churches of which one of them, the church on its founder's name, St. Macarius, has three altars. Here the altar of Saint John the Baptist dedicated to him as his bones are buried under this church with that of Elisha the prophet and 12 other skeletons. Egyptian monasteries have been inhabited by all kinds of people from the very poor to the very rich. A 20 minute drive from the rest house on the desert road and passing the small village of El Wadi we come to the second and most northern of the four monasteries in Wadi Natrun. Here lived little strangers, Maximus and Demetius of the Monastery of the Romans, Dear El Baramus, originally named after the Virgin Mary. Established in 340 AD by these two young Roman princes, sons of the Roman Emperor Valentinian. They arrived in Cetus after visiting the Christian shrines in Palestine. In Egypt they met Saint Macarios who served as the priest of the desert. Saint Macarios established for them their cells and taught them the way of salvation. The monastery has four churches. One church, the Holy Virgin, El Adra, has at the north wall of the church new ivory inlaid ferritory, relics holder. 
with glass windows containing the bodies of Saint Moses the Black and Saint Isidore. We must also mention Saint Arsanius, who was a tutor to the Empress' children. Saint Arsanius prayed, saying, Lord, lead me in the way whereby I may be saved. He had the reply, Arsanius, flee from men and you will be saved. After being a monk, he received another call. Arsenius, flee, keep silent, and live in solitude, for these are the roots of purity. He used to say, many times I talked and was sorry, but never was I sorry for silence. Coming to the monastery, he stood behind a column at the end of the church, weeping for his sins. The limestone cave which was inhabited by the late Pope Carolus VI during his early monastic life lies about two and a half kilometers away. This place became a popular place for pilgrimage. The site is marked by 12 elevated wooden crosses. The interior of the spacious cave is adorned with numerous icons and pictures of the wonder-making Pope and his patron, St. Minas of Marriott. Standing side by side are the two other monasteries at Wadi El Natrun. These are the monasteries of Saint Peshoy and the monastery of El Surian, or the Syrians. Today they make up the largest monastic community in the world. Saint Peshoy Monastery is the largest monastery both in the number of monks, over 130, and the amount of buildings. Like the majority of Coptic monasteries, the foundation of the monastery of Saint Peshoy is closely associated with the life of its patron saint. Saint Peshoy was one of a family of many children. When he was still young, an angel of the Lord appeared to his mother and selected Peshoy to be a monk. When he grew up, he responded willingly and went to Setters. While observing solitary life, Saint Peshoy experienced several visions of Christ. On one occasion, Christ passed by his cell, and Saint Peshoy stooped down to wash his master's feet, after which he drank the water as a blessing. Hundreds of visitors who visit this monastery will find seven churches or chapels, the main and largest church being that of Saint Peshoy, having three altars. Saint Peshoy Monastery was the smallest of the three other monasteries in Wadi Natrun until renovations began 20 years ago by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, who was papal residency. In this monastery also, the help of His Grace Bishop Sarabamun, the Bishop of St. Peshoy Monastery. Pope Shenouda was originally consecrated in the monastery of El Surien. Due to this monastery's small size and unique features, we will look at it more closely. El Surian Monastery was founded in the 6th century. From its early monastic history, the Naturan Valley attracted Christian devotees from different lands. Here, Syrian monks lived with the Copts from about the 8th to the 16th century. Also, after the destruction of the nearby monastery of St. John Cami in the 4th century, the monks of the monastery migrated to El Surian Monastery. Thus the monastery's name has been the Monastery of the Holy Virgin and St. John Kami, called Der il Suriyan. Like many old Coptic churches, the church is similar to an ark in shape, representing Noah's Ark, which saved believers from the flooded world. The monastery's main gate stands at the western part of the northern wall. These walls are considered the highest walls of all the monasteries. They are from the 9th century and their width is between 2 and 3 metres. These high walls were built around the cells, churches and the keep after many savage attacks by the barbarians. The principal church of the monastery is that of the Holy Virgin. 
Because of its artistic treasures, this church has repeatedly attracted the attention of archaeologists and architects. At the southeast corner of the keep is situated this beautiful church with its basilic roof and with the four rings of the cross ending in semi-domes. The church was built in 980 AD. The eastern part of the church has three altars, of which the middle sanctuary is dedicated to St. Mary. The church's most outstanding attractions are the choir and the sanctuary doors of the church with their magnificent ivory inlaid ornaments. The door of symbols or the door of prophecies of the middle sanctuary consists of six leaves, three forming a valve on each side. It dates back to 913 AD. Here Father Ioannis El Suriani explained each row. It was built here in 914. The third symbol is divided to many levels or many rows from up to down, cover all the Christian here. Each one speaks about an epoch, except the first level is icons. In the middle, our Lord Jesus Christ and Saint Mary, at right side, Coptic Bacchiaches, Saint Mark, and Saint Discord, at left. Uh, Syrian, Saint uh, Ignat, Saint Severe. These icons show the relation between the Coptic and Syrian churches. Beginning the second uh, level, the symbols are their crosses, all of them the same shape, and they are interference of crosses and the earth surrounded by interference circles. I speak about the Apostles here at the beginning of the church. When the faith was strong, there was one doctrine the church was united and the strong of the was persecuted. The third door, many circles, the same shape of course of each one. This vehicle was the Roman here, after the Romans they had believed by Christianity. There were many great centers of the church in the world, like Alexandria and Tukro. The first crescent in the middle and uh, similar to cross in the middle, sorry, and similar to crescent. I speak about the appearance of Islam. The fifth one, the sign of the swastika, is used here as a symbol of the heretics and the heretics. Then the present era, which we live now, many shapes of crosses are small and divided. Many shapes of crosses because the Christians they are many sectors. The crosses are small and divided to speak about the weakness of peace and love. The last one, one death cross is shining everywhere, it refers to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and will come the sign of the cross will appear in heaven. Uh, this door was made uh, by formations from the history before uh, it was made and the prophecies of the Bible. This church represents a typical early Christian church having three sections. The first section is reserved for the believers, the second for the catchments and the third for the mourners. During the service of liturgy, after the reciting of the creed, the doors of the first section are closed, allowing only the believers to attend the Eucharistic offering. Today, the church is open for all to attend. The first section of this church, in its northeastern corner, has the relics holder of the saints. These relics are shifted from the winter church during summer. This church is used during summer because it is more spacious. The feretory contains the relics of St. Kyriakos and his mother Julieta, St. Moses the Black, St. Severus, St. Dioscorus, St. John the Dwarf, the Forty Martyrs of Sebastian, St. Theodore and some hair of Mary Magdalene. They are kept together with those relics of St. John Cami and St. Ephraim the Syrian. 
There are other saints whose bodies have not decayed, like Saint Bishoy. The niche of the believer section have two frescoes dating to the 12th century. The southern niche depicts the Annunciation and the Nativity of Our Lord. The northern niche depicts the dormant of the Holy Virgin. Just recently, while renovation, this fresco dating to the 7th century was founded under another in the south end of the church. Hanging from the ceiling in front of the main sanctuary are several ostrich eggs. Upon looking at the egg, the believer remembers the resurrection and new life. Also, as the ostrich keeps her eyes on the egg until it hatches, so too God never keeps his eyes off us. There is also the third section and the nave. Here, in the middle of the church, is the epiphany basin fixed in the floor. It is used for the washing of feet ritual service on Covenant Thursday, the Feast of Epiphany and the Apostles' Feast. The western aisle of the nave leads to one of the most interesting monuments in the monastery. Now we enter the cave of Saint Michel. It is the oldest place in our monastery from the 4th century. In this cave, Saint Michel lived as a hermit, and our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him many times. You can enter and see. This narrow and low passage leads to the cell of Saint Bishoy. It was joined to Saint Bishoy's monastery by an underground tunnel. Saint Bishoy withdrew to this place to enjoy quiet prayer far from visitors. Saint Bishoy used to pray in this cell day and night, his hair being tied to the hook to prevent him from falling asleep and sinking down. There is a small square structure with an altar built against the east wall. During the winter months, services are held in the cave church, which is also dedicated to the Holy Virgin. The third church, that of Archangel Michael, is situated, as in all monasteries, on the third floor of the keep, the guardian of the place. El Kos, or the keep tower of the monastery, stands to the west of the northern gate. The keep was constructed early in the 5th century as a tower of refuge to all monks living in the area from the attacks by the desert Bedouins. It was the idea of Emperor Zeno who ordered its construction in 482 AD. The emperor, on learning that his daughter Hilari, who had disappeared from the palace, was living in the monastery of St. Macarius, disguised as a monk, Hilari, who was regarded as a eunuch, having been made a nun by St. Beman, sent architects to the Coptic monasteries in order of his daughter, who preferred to live and die with the monks of Egypt rather than enjoy the luxurious life in her father's palace. The keep is reached by a wooden drawbridge with one of its ends fixed to its doorstep and the other resting loose on the stairs. This end was attached to the keep with a chain. When it was pulled from within the building, the bridge rose and stood flat upon the wall. Thus, it hid the door and separated the building from the outer world. It consists of three floors, the third floor being the chapel dedicated to Archangel Michael. Monks' cells were located on the first and second floors. Here behind this door is one of the cells of His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, where he used to live during early monastery life. There were secret passages leading to the outside of the monastery. The monks could survive within the keep for many months until it was safe enough for them to go to their own cells.
There is also the basement for storage of the food, which was mainly dry figs, beans and lentils. Here still exists after 200 years dry termus. To the east of the Church of the Cave stands St. Ephraim's tree. When St. Ephraim visited St. Bishoy's cell, he left his stick outside. When he came out, he found that it budded. It is known as St. Ephraim's tree. And it is a tamarind tree. The monastery also has a museum with many of the old artifacts which have survived until today old jars and stone mortars icons made of pebbles oil lanterns Vestments and tunics. Some symbols and ancient wood stamps. 12th century marble tray from Nubia. Crosses. Altar vessels. And icons dating to the 16th and 17th century. of Saint Samuel the Confessor.
The body of Saint Pesada, like that of Saint Pishoy and many others, have not decayed. So too the body of Saint Demadios. As all Coptic churches, there are hand-painted Coptic icons, blessed with the holy Myrun oil. Here are some examples. The late father Andraus El Samuili. He is also recognized as a 20th century holy and simple monk. The Holy Family visited 16 areas in Egypt and ended their journey here in the monastery of El Muharraq. The monastery starts at the foot of the western mountain of Kos Khan, 12 kilometers to the west of Asyut. To the west of the monastery is a church dedicated to the Holy Virgin. This church stands in the same cave where the Holy Family lived for six months and ten days. As Isaiah prophesied, here stands in the middle of Egypt the first Christian altar in the whole world. On this altar Jesus the infant slept and thus consecrated the church for the monastery. Although this church is dated early in the first century, the monastery of El Moharak was built later in the fourth century. This place is considered today by all the people, the Jerusalem of Egypt, in which thousands of pilgrims come and take its blessings. Until the middle of the 20th century, two active monasteries existed in Upper Egypt. The Monastery of the Holy Virgin Deir el Mahara, and the Monastery of Saint Samuel at El Kalamun. Due to the vigorous leadership of Pope Shenouda III, the Upper Egyptian monasteries are now experiencing a revival. The following are inhabited by a few monks. The Monastery of Dronka, a suit. Saint Shenouda Suhag. The Virgin Mary, Archangel Michael, Saint George, 
and the martyrs of Achmim. Saint Bacomius and Saint Hedra in Aswan. One of the most modern monasteries in Egypt is that of Saint Minas of Mariut in Alexandria. This monastery was rebuilt in 1960 on the site of the ruins of the old monastery by the late Pope Carolus VI, the 116th Pope. Today, many visitors come and take his blessings as St. Minas was and still is renowned for the many miracles that are being performed. Also buried at the eastern end of the cathedral is the body of the late Pope Carolus VI, who is acknowledged by many as a 20th century saint. For his love to St. Minas, his patron saint, Pope Carolus wanted very much to be buried in this monastery. All the monasteries we see alive today in Egypt has been due to the blessings and prayers of His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, the 117th Patriarch of the See of St. Mark. Chosen by God in 1971 as the Coptic Patriarch, Pope Shenouda put in his heart the care of repopulating and renovating the monasteries, both spiritually and architecturally and also reopening many of the old monasteries. Today there exists a papal residency in St. Bishoy's monastery. Here residing also are two monks who administer the papal residency. Father Angelus il Ambebshoi and Father Suriel in Mbeb Shoy, originally youth from Australia. The papal residency can accommodate over 100 visitors. Here are some of the guest houses. level of this building is a church. On the ground level is a lecture room where His Holiness lectures to the theological students. The conference building and computer rooms. Here many religious conferences are held, like this conference of San Dismos, a worldwide orthodox youth organization. There is also the U-shaped building. This has a large kitchen and dining room on the first floor. On the second floor, there is a church. Here is a fully equipped church for non-Orthodox Christians to pray their own mass or any other form of worship.
Also behind this gate is the Patriarchate building. It can accommodate other religious leaders and their entourage. trees are planted here. The beautiful carved door on the Patriarchate building. beautiful are the works of God. Often ask why some men join the community of a desert monastery or even retire into a cave to live. There are two main reasons. One, purely for the love of God and the desire to devote more hours in prayer and meditation in seclusion. And two, through a special calling in the form of a vision, a dream or inspiration.
Then who is a monk? Someone who lives apart from the world in a spiritual community, devoting himself to prayer, contemplation, and the performance of religious duties. He may prefer to live as a hermit, dwelling alone and meeting other members of the community only occasionally, as in church and at mealtime in the monastery refectory. A Cenobitic monk, on the other hand, lives in a clustered community and follows a strictly organized pattern of daily life. The monks who now take their vows are young people who are mostly university graduates. Their skills or professions, that of engineers, pharmacists, physicians, architects, agricultural engineers and accountants, have benefited their monasteries and the communities around them. On entering the monastery he chooses, the young man wears a light blue garment and stays in the retreat house. He actually participates in all of the monastic chores. After many months in the monastery and through the guidance and acceptance of the abbot or bishop, he is accepted as a novice. To be accepted as a novice, a candidate must be over 17 years of age and supply a recommendation from a priest who is usually his confession father. He has to undergo a period of probation extending from one to three years. All monasteries have a retreat houses for young men who wish to leave the pressure of the outside world and come to a calm and holy atmosphere. He can come on his own or with a group from his parish, with a written letter accompanying him from his confession father. He can be accommodated for a day or several weeks. The set rules or regulations of the retreat house enables him to engage in the monastery's praises or tasbeha and the holy liturgy. In every retreat house, there is a monk from the monastery who takes care of its administrating. This monk becomes the spiritual father for all who lodge in the house. Apart from their personal prayers, the youth attend nightly spiritual meetings with the Holy Father. The consecration of a monk is like a joyous day in heaven. The novice chosen to be consecrated will either be told beforehand a day or two, or even the night before, unexpectedly. The celebration begins early in the morning at 6 a.m. after the Tezbaha, with all the monks, novices and visitors attending this joyous occasion. Chosen novices, which are usually between three or seven in number, lie on the ground next to the body of the church's saint, in this case, Saint Beshoy's body. Covered with the veil that also covered the coffin of Saint Beshoy, this symbolizes their burial as the monk dies from the world and lives purely for the worship of God. The hymns are sung both in joyous and sad tunes. The consecration is conducted by either the Pope or the Bishop of the monastery. This celebration might happen once or twice a year, depending on the number of novices chosen to become monks. In the words of Saint Jerome, it is marks of great faith and of great virtue to be the pure temple of God, to offer oneself a whole burnt offering, and according to the Apostle Paul, to be holy in both body and in spirit.
celebration goes on for 90 minutes. The monk is then given his new black tunic a hood on his head and a belt around his waist. and a leather cross to wear. The monk is given a new name following the name of the monastery he has been consecrated in. For example, the monk Angelos, consecrated in the monastery of Saint Bishoy, becomes Angelos el Anba Bishoy. The monk must also allow his beard to grow as he does not worry much about his outward appearance but more on his inward appearance. After the holy liturgy with symbols in their hands and joyous tunes, the monks of the monastery form a procession around the monastery for the new monks. after which the consecrated monk remains in his cell for three days in spiritual vigil and solitude. The monk's daily life. There is no very precise timetable. Each monk arranges most of his own time under the guidance of his spiritual father. A monk's day usually begins just after midnight, after he has slept during the first half of the night. At 3 a.m. the church bell wakes him for private devotions. Each monk in his own cell saying the midnight office, making matanya or prostrations and saying personal prayers. A second bell at 4 a.m. summons him to the church where he chants together with his brother monks in Coptic, the midnight psalmody or tasbeha. Upon entering the church, the monk would prostrate in front of the main altar, worshipping the Lord God Almighty. Then he goes in front of the saints' relics praying, asking for the blessings of these saints. The prayer starts off with the readings of the morning hour prayers from the Yegbeya prayer book. After this, the monks and novices divide themselves into two halves in front of the altar, each group facing the east on either side. The midnight psalmody comprise of four canticles and the Theotokia for Saint Mary. They praise God, the Creator and Saviour of the universe for everything, the angels, the saints and even the nature of the world. This beautiful melody of hymns start off with the first canticle reminding us of the exodus of Moses. They attain such harmony in their singing of these melodies that their voices are blended together, expressing the unity of their spirit. They sing too and praise the Lord with one heart and one voice. Monks who attend the midnight psalmody 
feel the presence of holiness, peace, and inner tranquility as if they are in the heavens above. It is said that during these hymnologies, the devils flee far away from the monastery into the desert, showing us how powerful the prayers are of these monks. Two hours later, the morning matin is prayed, offering of morning incense. The third hour and sixth hour prayers of the Agbeya are read, and the divine liturgy is celebrated. Here, all monks wear white tunics and hoods, resembling purity and holiness. The Holy Liturgy is celebrated by monk priests only, as they have been ordained as priests, and the other monks would pray either as altar deacons or outside in the choir as the congregation. This is important as the Holy Mass can only be celebrated with these three present, the priest, the deacon, and the congregation. During fasts like Lent, Advent and the Apostles' fast in which there is a need of abstinence of food, the Holy Liturgy can be celebrated after midday. Depending also on how large the monastery is and how many churches it has, the Holy Eucharist can be offered on several altars at the same time. This happens mostly when married priests are taught how to celebrate the Holy Liturgy. These married priests are chosen from their parishes and after ordination by the patriarch or bishop, they serve for 40 days in a chosen monastery. Here, Father Ya'ub, Father Abanub, Father Shenouda and Father Antonius newly ordained priests from Australia were celebrating the Holy Liturgy. After the Holy Mass is finished, about 7 a.m., the monk would go to his cell and rest for a while before engaging in the particular vocation to which he is suited or which has been assigned to him, be it carpentry, gardening, cooking, baking, copying or other communal services. Throughout, he is supposed to be silently praying or attending other prayers. Pray continually, St. Anthony ordered his monks. Avoid vainglory, sing psalm before sleep, and on awakening, hold in your heart the commandments of the scripture. In the refectory, while sitting at their meals in order of the monks' consecration date, monks do not engage in conversation about worldly or social topics, but eat silently, listening to a fellow monk read to them the passages from Bustan el Roban, Paradise of the Fathers, and similar works of edification. This gathering occurs once a day at noon at all monasteries except Deir el Surian, where the monks are given their own share of food to be eaten in their cells. The monks fast for more than two-thirds of the year. Apart from total abstinence from meat, fish and dairy products during the fast, the quantity of food taken and the length of the period between eating depends entirely on the monk himself. There are four main aspects of monastic life. One, isolation from the world. Two, chastity, which by modifying the body helps a monk to attain a pure and more dedicated spiritual life. Three, voluntary poverty in fulfillment of Christ's teachings, saying, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Four, obedience and readiness to comply with and submit to the guidance and commands of his abbot. Among Coptic monks, Saint John the Dwarf is considered paragon of virtue and obedience. It is related that his mentor, Saint Beeman, 
once handed him his walking staff and told him to plant it and water it regularly. Though water was not easily available, John continued to look after it until the staff budded and gave fruit. Beeman offered its fruit to the monk saying, eat the fruit of obedience. A young monk asked an older one how he will be saved. Remain seated in your cell, was the reply. A life of solitude, silence and quiet reflection is needed. In the solitude of his own cell, the monk finds solace in prayer and the study of the scriptures and devotional literature. The most important and most used place in the monastery is the monk's private cell. types of cells that the monks live in. The first type of cell is one in a building of cells which is within the ancient monastery walls. These are mostly occupied by the older monks who joined the monastery in the earlier years. The second type of building of cells that is situated outside the ancient monastery but within the 20th century new walls surrounding the monastery. The buildings can accommodate between 50 and 100 cells. These cells are equipped with electricity and fresh running water from the artesian basin 80 metres underground. The third type is an individual cell that is built by the monastery for a monk who wishes to live within the walls of the monastery but not too far from the church. These scattered cells can be seen all over the monastery of El Surien. Here is the cell of His Holiness Pope Shenouda III. Each of these cells is made up of three parts. One, the Mahbasa, or the private room of monks, where he prays and sleeps, where no one enters or sees. Two, the waiting room or the reading room where other monks can visit and are welcomed in this room. Three, the washroom and kitchen. of cell is an isolated cell far away from the monastery buildings where the monk lives in utter seclusion. Shenouda III, who lived the life of a solitary for many years, there are five stages through which the solitary must pass before he reaches the stage of absolute isolation from the world. They are as follows. The first is a member of a Cenobitic community. The second is a beginner in solitary life within the monastery itself. The beginner observes complete silence performing his work quietly while remaining in his cell. He thereby develops a feeling of alienation from the community so that he becomes a stranger among his brethren. The third is persevering in this solitude for several weeks. At this stage the monk still lives in the monastery but leaves his cell only once a week on Sunday to attend the celebration of the divine liturgy. The fourth stage in this transference from the monastery to the cave so as to be removed from all people. The fifth and final stage is that of the itinerary anchorite who lives in caves unknown to anyone except God. 
Today there are a few monks who live as hermits in underground cells or caves scattered all over the desert Cetus. One example of this is the cell of Father Philoxenos, El Surien, located a distance of 20 minutes drive through the rough desert sand. The only thing visible on arriving on top of the sand was semicircular bricks made for the cell's air vents. Upon entering, the sense of tranquility filled the air. As there was no electricity, Father Philoxenos used gas lamps. Water is stored in large tanks and food sent to him by car weekly. He also goes to the monastery on Saturdays by foot for the Sunday service. With us on this journey was the abbot of the monastery, Il Surien, Father Sedaros, who knew all the landmarks of the desert. Monasticism is not disappearing, but some aspects of a monk's life have to be modified to fit modern times. Monks today choose their way of life through true faith and conviction not as an escape from the world. Due to modern technology, the types of work available to the monk has made it easier for him to spend more time in spiritual meditation. For example, all monasteries had manual power generators which took a monk many hours to supervise and maintain. Today, however, most monasteries have electricity installed in them. Let's look now at some of the types of work available for the monks. The monks in many monasteries today can live off the produce of the fruit and vegetables that grow there. Of the many acres of agriculture around the monastery, there is usually one or two monks in charge of the overall supervision. Although the monk might physically work on the field, there are many labourers who do most of the tedious work. Of the plants that grow on these fields, there are fruits of mangoes, oranges, apples, grapes, figs, guafa, and pomegranates. There are also vegetables of potatoes, tomatoes, beans, watermelons, rock melons, and capsicum. The success of agricultural projects is well known worldwide in the monastery of St. Macarius. The transformation of areas of yellow desert sand into green fields produce heavier crops than areas of black soil by the implementation of results of detailed scientific research. So the desert has become green and blossomed and the bare sands have bore fruit of which are the best in the world. The fields are irrigated by two main water pumps. The water is fresh spring water pumped from 80 meters within the ground. The fresh water is pumped and channeled to various parts of the plantations. Thus the ground is always rich with water and fertile. There are also several ponds around the monastery with a variety of fish. These fish are caught and consumed by the monks. The farmhouse is located at the far end of the fields. This is also run by the monastery monks supervising the many workers under him. All the monastery's produce is said to be the best in all of Egypt. A large variety of different kinds of chicken can be seen here. The eggs are usually more than enough to feed the monks and visitors. What is left over can be sold to major companies as these eggs are the largest and freshest in Egypt. has also cattle which are properly fed and looked after for their high quality yield of both meat and milk. The manure produced by the cattle is also important for the reclamation of the desert.
The sheep and goats are well tended, as they also contribute in grazing of unwanted weeds. are presently set up in a remote area of the monastery using high quality bees for honey production. All this produce has come about not only by the help of man but by the prayers and blessings of the monks and the presence of God in the monastery. The milk from the cattle and goats is taken to manufacture other types of food such as cheeses, butter, cream and yogurt. Due to the increase of monks and many visitors that flock to the monastery, there is need for more cells and other facilities to accommodate for their demands. Thus there are many buildings being constructed. Each building structure and internal designs is supervised by a monk who was originally an architect or engineer before entering the monastic life. Each of the areas we have just covered has been successfully accomplished due to the many laborers participating in each project. These men, ranging from ages of 12 up to the age of 50, come all the way from Upper Egypt seeking work. Father Metias El Anba Bishoy, who is responsible for 300 laborers in the monastery of Anba Bishoy, decides who is legible for work, many of which are young men who are on their four months school vacation. All the laborers receive, apart from their wages, free accommodation, food, clothing and medical care. The monastery also provides them with religious, moral and vocational training. They stay for one month or more in a particular work area, then go home for a week or two. After partaking in work here, both Christian and Muslim alike feel the blessings in their lives. The monastery is fully equipped with medical facilities such as dentistry, optical and surgical. The computer has also entered the monastery. It is used for many tasks such as storing scanned manuscripts of old Coptic and Arabic handwritten gospels. This is done at St. Mina's monastery in Mariut. There are also printing facilities in monasteries of St. Macarius and El Baramos in order to print books of all sorts of Christian literature. The monastery has no regular source of income and no bank account. The monks do not solicit donations, publicize the monastery's financial needs or receive financial organization. And yet, when the monastery's needs are put before God in their communal prayers, donations are received daily, miraculously meeting their needs exactly. The monks, therefore, have no doubt that God has undertaken responsibility for this enormous work, not only in the spiritual, but also in the material realm. I suppose the most popular type of work a monk can perform is welcoming the visitors and show them around the monastery. 
Many of the visitors are Egyptians who come on parish bus trips. These organized trips can come from all over Egypt. They can be monthly or twice annually. Although these simple people might have come to the monastery once before, they feel it necessary to come again and again due to the many miracles that they see and hear of. The sick come asking for health, and those in spiritual agony or discomfort speak with the fathers for a word of relief. Also, some might have evil spirits in them by which a gifted father would pray on the afflicted for the evil spirit to leave. On normal days, several busloads of 50 each flock to the monasteries. On the other hand, during major feasts, hundreds of busloads inundate the monastery. Many foreigners also visit the monasteries, usually those from Germany, England, America and Australia. Visiting hours start from 7am to 7pm, when the monastery's doors are closed. Some monasteries are open every day, like St. Pishoy, and others are very strict and only allow visitors on certain days, like St. Macarius' monastery. On the other hand, the monastery of Il Surien, although adjacent to St. Pishoy's monastery, closes the doors during the monks' daily prayers and during fastings. Upon entering the monastery, the visitors are taken to the main church and given a brief history of the monastery. Then they are taken for a tour around the monastery. People can visit the four monasteries of Wed in the Troon within a single day. By the end of the tour, the monk guiding gives the visitors a blessing of either oil or a picture with some holy spices, Henut. Visitors who wish to stay for a night or two in the monastery may have permission from the monastery office in Cairo. There are facilities to accommodate several trips of 100 to 200 visitors. These guest houses are either built within the monastery for males or outside the monastery for families due to the noise that can disturb the monks or peace of the monastery. Each room has comfortable beds, cupboards, desks and a balcony. There is a clean bathroom and a large kitchen which is usually supervised by a novice and a monk in charge of the guest house. These visitors need to be fed. Although most of them bring their own food, the hospitality of the monastery offers the visitors its produce. Above all this, the visitor asks for el -Khobs, the monastery bread. of years ago the monks would have baked this bread only once a week. Today the bread is baked daily by electronic baking machines which make the dough and cuts the bread in even round pieces. Due to the demand many people visiting the monastery wanting to take home a souvenir to remember this blessed occasion. The monastery has made a gift shop at its gate which sells souvenirs leather and wooden crosses, pictures of various saints, and devotional literature in the form of books, cassettes, and videotapes. Most of the items sold here have been made by the Monastery Carpentry Workshop. Here at St. Bishoy's Monastery, established in August 1991, and opened by His Holiness, Pope Shenouda III, is one of the most fascinating workshops. Looking after this area, are two monks from the monastery with some of the men employed working with them. Here they make leather wallets and calendars with St. Bishoy's picture on them.
chains are manufactured here. Medallions of many kinds. Key rings and crosses. In another room with great care and precise placing, these men make the beautiful hand-hurled crosses of ivory and ebony. Also, the chalice thrones and the relic holders are made here. woodwork is carried out in this area. forms of plaques that need to be coated with gold or silver are sent here for their last stage. other chores that a monk can do but are not usually seen by many. Let us look at two of these. The Holy Eucharist is celebrated at 6 a.m. normally, but there are preparations beforehand. At 3 a.m. the Holy Bread, or El Korban, is baked fresh for the offertory. Here Father Suriel El Suriani prepares the flour, yeast and water. One kilo of normal flour is mixed with two and a half teaspoons of yeast dissolved in lukewarm water. Lukewarm water is added, then the dough is mixed properly. The dough is then taken, cut into pieces, and rolled up to release air bubbles.
Then these round pieces are left for a few minutes to allow for the rising process to take place. Then each of the pieces is placed on a flat surface and with the palm of his hands gently forms the round flat shape. Throughout the making of the holy bread, the monk would secretly pray the 151 psalms of the Agbeya. It is then stamped with a wooden stamp. Then five holes are pierced in the middle resembling the three nails driven into the hands and feet of Christ while on the cross, the crown of thorns and the side pierced with a sword. The piece is then taken and put on the side to enable the dough to rise. Then this round piece is put in the oven for baking, after which the result is the perfect korbana for offertory. Around the four crosses in the middle of the bread is written in Greek, Holy God, Holy Almighty, Holy Immortal, which are the words sung by the hosts of angels in heaven. This bread is one of a group to be offered for Eucharist. One of these will become the actual body of Christ. In the privacy of his own cell, a monk can engage in many different vocations, like writing books, making leather crosses, or even painting icons. Here, Father Suriel El Suriani uses his spare hours in the artwork of picture paintings. His paintings have been placed in many churches and monasteries. The monk engages in any of the many types of work in the monastery. However, it is not compulsory to carry out the labour in person, but can direct some labourers. Thus, he is free to go about and to do other personal chores like meeting other monks, pray the sixth and the ninth hour prayers, and eat. At around 5pm, the Eastern Bell Tower summons the monks and novices for daily sunset prayers. Here under the tree of Saint Ephraim, the monks of El Surian stand facing the east in rows of three in order of consecration. Each monk that partakes in prayer greets the other monk standing. The eleventh hour prayer is prayed and consists of twelve psalms, a gospel reading from Saint Luke and an absolution. Finally, at 6 p.m., the monk ends his day and has the rest of the evening to meditate during his walk in the desert. 
Some monks use this opportunity to go to the monastery's library and read from the thousands of valuable books, manuscripts and audio tapes available. These books range from religious to educational and can be in Coptic, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, English, French or German. enter his cell to pray the prayer before sleeping at midnight prayers, thus praying the seven daily prayers. He will then sleep at around 9 p.m. for a total of six hours to wake up the following morning at 3 a.m. for another day. We can group the monks into four types. One, the monk who lives in the monastery community Two, the working monk who serves in the world outside the monastery. By special order of the Patriarch, they serve in churches in Egypt and abroad when needed as priests or helpers to a priest. They have not abandoned meditation and prayers, but still live under rigid monastic rule. Examples of monk priests in Australia are Father Tadros El Bakumi, Father Theodosius El Anba Bishoy and Father Musa El Suriani. As they are monks, it is necessary for them at least once a year to go back to their monastery for spiritual revival. As Saint Anthony said, just as a fish would die out of water, a monk would perish if he tarried long away from his cell. Three, the solitary or hermit in the cave. Four, the anchorite, spirit born, or as they are usually called, El Suah. This type of monk has reached a high level of spirituality, where his spirit is heavier than his body, as he rarely eats. There is a saying which says that, as the body groweth, the soul becometh weak, but the more the body becometh weaker, the more the soul groweth. They are in groups and live together and can easily go from place to place without anyone seeing them. There is a story of a monk who was very hot tempered. He left the life of the community and went to live alone in a cave to avoid the sin of anger. It happened during his isolation that he became thirsty. So he went to drink water from the pitcher but found it empty. In his anger, he hurled the pitcher so that it broke. Then he said to himself, I have left this monastery, but the anger is still inside me. Hence, we are in need of communal life to discover our weakness. We are also in need of time of retreat so that we may struggle against our weakness. Can a monk leave the monastery for good? 
The monk freely entered the monastery and he can freely leave. Although the monks have vowed to be consecrated to God, their temptation is great and the devil can make the monks fall into this sin. Monks are frequently referred to as angels of God and are regarded therefore with great respect. <laughs> 